simulate the solar cells, you can either do that with graphical interface, which we will do, or maybe in the future you might want to use uh, your own scripts, okay? So that's more of a graduate work, but you can, that also accepts uh, scripts to define the junction, the, to define the, uh, the certain points uh, of the s uh, solar cell, like we will discuss. Okay, we'll just use the graphical interface and uh, continue with the uh, simulation. So you, you must be all here underneath the second part. And we're just gonna run a few examples that were already embedded in the software here. So we're gonna click on this thing that says example. We're gonna call the examples. First, we're gonna to refresh our memory and to make sure that everything settles down, all that information, we're gonna uh, simulate an, a simple uh, diode. So under uh, no illumination. Okay, so select that. It's a crystalline silicon solar cell, but there is no light coming in. So it's just gonna act like a normal PN junction diode. All right, once you select that, there's gonna be three layers here. So let's make that two. Because we won't be really caring too much about the third layer here. And let's just quickly look into the, uh, the definitions of the layers. So this first layer is 300 nanometers thick. So let's try to draw the, the layers. This is the first layer that is 300 nanometers. And what's the type? That's the second information, it's n-type. See, it's not just n-type, but it is heavily doped. So what did we say about the heavily doped uh, notation? We would put a plus, right? Because by experience, I know that this is really very, very highly doped. Remember, I talked about the saturation point at some point uh, in, during the uh, discussions. It's like around uh, 10 to the 20 level. So this is quite close to that. And the band gap is modified accordingly. So it's a little different than the usual 1.1 electron volts uh, of the uh, silicon too. But it's not really far away either. Okay. Uh, Several of these are not super important for us, but okay, so let's not go into the discussion of those. Yeah, that will be good enough for us for the diode. All right, now let's switch to the second layer here. And let's try to draw it in a scale. So this is C in terms of micrometers, almost 200 micrometers long. So let me change the color. This is really long. This is my, this time, of course, we have the N type, so we will have the P type. And see, it's not that heavily doped, so it's only 10 to the 16, the concentration uh, of the dopant. All right, so what did we have for the P type? So we have the holes here, right? And we have the electrons. These were the, what we called, the majority of the population. So they are the majority carriers. We still have some electrons here as well, but they're tiny, their concentration is tiny. And as for here, we have the electrons as the majority carriers. Okay. And so we are kind of ready to actually uh, do the simulation. So once we go up here, we defined the layers. I, we didn't really play a lot with the layers definitions. They were already there. Now, if you go to the absorption, this is what we will use for uh, the case when we illuminate the diode, okay? We're not there yet. And uh, we will also make use of the, but the, these are, ex, ex, uh, again, they have to do with the context. Uh, we won't be making use of these a lot. Now, coming to the simulation, it's now under dark. Uh, and let's change this to be from minus one uh, because I want you to see the reverse bias condition too. 
Okay, so we're going to scan from minus 1 volts. So what are we doing? We are tying this up. This is not a solar cell yet. We're tying this up to a power supply, a battery. And remember, what would be the polarization? Uh, of course, during the scan, it's going to change. So it once it's minus 1, Okay. So ideally, remember, we would like to put the plus sign, the uh, uh, what we said, the anode side to be attached to the p-type. And the other side would be the n-type. So I'm hoping it didn't kick me out. One second. Okay. All right. Yeah, we're still here. Good. All right. So we are ready uh, to simulate. So we can hit the simulate button. We will see the effect of this first the equilibrium condition when there is no battery. But then uh, we will see the effect when we have the, the battery. Okay, while it's doing that, let me share my other screen with you. Because I would like to remind you what the expectation would be. Okay, so hopefully you can see the slide here now. So what was our expectation? So we had the N and uh, P sides. So this is the forward bias. So remember, we had the the p type oops the p type here and the n type here we would have the band bending condition maybe we can first talk about the other slide yes right so under equilibrium conditions this was our situation we had the the p type here and the n type here. How do I know that? Because the Fermi level again is close to the uh, uh, the valence band for the p type, and the holes are the majority carriers here for the p type. As for the n type, the Fermi level is cl close to the conduction band, and this would be the equilibrium condition. What was prohibiting the current? Well. These electrons that are the majority carriers on the n-type would have to hop over this naturally occurring barrier, right? How did that barrier occur? Just let me refresh your memory. We had these uh, carrier, uh, uh, these electrons here on the n-type, and for the p-type we had the holes. Once we put them together. They kind of diffuse very, very quickly to each other's side, but that's like a very transient action. Later on, once they are gone, okay, once they are gone, they left behind the uncompensated ionized uh, dopants. What were they? Well, every hole was compensated by the boron, right? So if we think of holes as the anti-electron, so they have like a positive charge, so that was being uh, compensated by the negatively charged boron ions in the crystal. So boron would be embedded, so we would have these guys left. Once the charge carriers are all depleted in this depletion region. And very similarly, we had the electrons compensating the, uh, the phosphorus. And they would have a plus because once their electron has gone away, uh, they would have a, uh, they would be ionized uh, and they would become a plus charge ion. So this, uh, when we put the p-n junction together, created, as you can see, a capacitor kind of parallel plate capacitor with plus charges here, negative charges here. So as soon as you see that, but remember the electric field formation. Okay, and I emphasized yesterday that the 
electrons as negative charged particles would see these ions here. They are really troublesome ions for the electron, the poor electron, because whenever the electron wants to jump to this side to conduct, right? That's how the conduction will happen. The electron will be transferred from this side to the other side. It would be repelled back. It will say, no, I don't want you here. These ions would be stopping. Likewise, the holes would be stopped as positively charged particles, quasi-particles. They would be uh, stopped by these ions here. So there would be no conduction in the end. And that would be the reason of this barrier for the electron. The probability of conduction would be proportional, I mean, would be exponentially decaying while we're increasing this potential barrier. Okay, so far so good. And then that's what we did. We, we decreased the potential by applying a poten uh, an outside potential uh, to fight back against this barrier. So we put a battery and we lowered down this potential barrier. So we enabled this hopping for the electrons. So what happened is electrons, we were majority carriers here. They hop to this other side and they become the minority carriers. And it's actually in the diode, this minority carrier action uh, into the, uh, the other side that will create us the current. This will be the different thing for the solar cells as uh, you might remember and as we will again see. All right, now let's get back to the simulation. So I am gonna share my other screen. Okay, so first, this is refreshing us about the doping concentration. So I hope the simulation also ended on your side. So this is just showing us the doping concentration and it might be actually good to set this to zero because we'd like to see things under equilibrium first. Okay, so just, just use this slide bar here and uh, put things to zero. Okay, so what do I see? I see the acceptor concentration all around. Why? Because the end site was very thin, right? I just talked about it. So we are gonna zoom into this region here with our mouse and just draw a, a rectangle uh, and then you will see that. Okay, there we go. This is of course logarithmic scale. So this is a better view. So we have the, uh, the donor concentration going up to 10 to the 19 here. Whereas the acceptors are 10 to the 16 here, as you can see. Okay. Can you show us how to do that part again? Say that again, sorry. No, he can't hear you. Yeah. If you have a can you hear can you hear uh, Yes, Osman? when when you're closer to the computer or the uh, microphone I can hear you better, yes. Can you repeat that? The mics on your desk are not working. The only mic you really know works is the one you're on the computer, sorry. No, I was just asking, can you um, show us how to do that part again? Sure, of course, of course. So if you want to zoom out, so you will use the right click. So right click will take you back. So this is where we started, okay? So what I'm going to do is click on your left click, and it's going to say zoom number one, for example. And then I'm drawing this rectangle here, and then just releasing the left click. And then I'm going to do that again because I'm not seeing it in the full scale. So I'm going to draw another rectangle like that, maybe even another one, because why am I drawing all these rectangles? Because look, the end side is very thin. The reason will be apparent uh, when we use the solar cell mode. This is still the PN junction, a simple PN junction. So I hope this solved the problem on your end. Now the donor concentration is 10 to the 19, as you can see here. And the, uh, uh, the acceptor concentration is here. So the junction is expected to be here when these two meet. Okay. So now after visualizing this, this is something we already put into the simulation tool. So this is not really a, a result. We already have put that in. We are going to be looking into the energy band diagram. So let's choose energy band diagram because I would like to emphasize that any solid state device cannot be understood or will be best understood, I should say, with the presence of band diagrams rather than mathematics, I would say. 
So once you select energy band diagrams, it's going to bring you this. So again, what do I see? I, oops, I simply just see the P side. How do I know that? Because this is, again, the conduction band of the P side. This is the Fermi level. Okay, so it's saying quasi Fermi level because I haven't, I forgot to put this to zero. Okay. Uh, actually, I'm kind of shorting that there. Yeah. Okay, so uh, now we have the, the valence band here. The Fermi level is very close to the valence band, as you can see. So that's just the P side. What I'm going to do is I will zoom into this side again, just like I did before, to look into the band banding. So just like where the, uh, similarly what I did last time. So even if you make mistakes like I did, there are happy mistakes, happy accidents. So that's all fine. So let's try to zoom into this region. I need to zoom out and if you make a mistake, just zoom out with your left, uh, right click and then try it again. Okay, so this is good. Okay, right. Now we are able to see the band banding uh, much clearer. So I have this, the, the P side here. And I have the end site here, and look, the uh, Fermi level is even embedded to the conduction uh, band. So this is this is what I meant by really heavily doped site. The likelihood of finding an electron is very very high on this site, right? So that showed us the water level. The if you would like to picture it that way, this is showing us in a way the water level of finding or the, the the water sea level of the electron so it's really really here on the other side it's only here so it's not as likely as uh, the other side by far it's this is really uh, drastically different okay now as the first as the uh, next thing let's look at the carrier concentration okay so once you select carrier concentration it's going to show us what the holes of course where inside the p site so let's draw that again just to make it visual for us while we're examining so this was the the large p site and the other one was the small n site so i will have holes here all the way and electrons here so there's going to be a depletion region here, but then I will assume that these are still in a way like quasi neutral. Okay, so I will have holes here and that's their concentration. I told you it's not depleted of electrons, so I still have some electrons here as well. Okay, so what, what's the interest? Well, the interest is to put this first to zero. Okay, and then zoom in again to the P junction, PN junction. So doing the same thing. All right. And on the other side, of course, I have electrons. So how do I know that I have created the depletion region? Because see, they, they are getting depleted. The charge carriers are uh, getting really low within this region here. Okay, but now let's try to understand the effect of the voltage because I told you that in the uh, diode case, the simple diode case with the applied battery, I will, if I put it in the right condition, the right po uh, polarization, like plus and minus, plus to the P side, N uh, side gets the negative side, then we would encourage the electrons basically to hop to the other side and start conducting. So that was how we were doing it. So basically what we're gonna hopefully see is that this, this concentration uh, will rise up and the electrons will be able to penetrate to the, the P side. 
So let's see what will happen. Now this is uh, the zero voltage. You can say options here and uh, you can click to be a little faster because it has a lot of voltage values there. It's all up to you. And then you can click this guy here. See, like I told you, the electrons are jumping to the other side. How? Well, with the applied voltage, especially after like 0 0.7 volts that you can see here, the concentration has been really elevated. Now, the electrons are on the other side, but the level between the con uh, concentration of holes and the electrons are really not that high either. So we, we are able to encourage the electrons to jump to the other side. This, this is all thanks to the plus voltage that I'm giving. So you would expect that we would obtain a current out of this and it's exponentially gonna increase because I have an exponentially increasing uh, 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 number of uh, charge carriers on this side. Okay, now let's do the reverse. So we will go playing with the scroll bar. We will not play, click this, but we'll go to the other side so this time it's the polarization will be different. So let's think about that. The polarization will be different. So first actually let's try to visualize the maybe the energy band diagrams. So switching back to the energy band diagrams. Now I'm gonna scroll to the other side, to the negative side. What would we expect as we emphasize, if we do that, we would build up more and more electric field inside so that would make uh, sure that we would have a larger barrier here. So the barrier will increase. So let's see. For the positive side, I know that the barrier will decrease. For the negative application, the barrier will start really increasing. So if I click, yeah, it zooms out. So you can see the whole, the barrier, and then you can zoom in again to see. So as I do that, it's really becoming really, really high. Okay, so at this point, let's look. So I have, I have majority carriers as holes here, right? But there is a, a barrier for the holes to the, go to the other side here. So um, since it's actually the opposite charge, so for them, they're seeing the exact, I mean, very similar barrier that they were seeing here. So even though it seems that they have to go down, it's actually the other way around because these are positively charged particles. So the energy bands, the, uh, if this is a barrier for the electron, in this case, like going up like this, it's gonna be a barrier for the hole to jump to the other side too. So for that, uh, in that case, while I'm increasing this barrier, I'm actually trying to drive the poor little electrons that are here. How? Because I have created a large electric field. Uh, I have uh, now the, uh, the ionized charges left. So I have these charges left and I'm also making sure that I'm applying more positive here and more negative there. So these poor electrons, whatever we have, we'll try to hop to the other side, but it's actually like uh, falling down the waterfall. It doesn't really matter how much uh, the barrier or the waterfall is, the height of the waterfall is. It's actually more about the number of electrons that are sitting here that will determine the new current. So this will be all limited because I don't have too much of population of electrons on this side. So it will not be very much dependent on the applied voltage anymore because that's just uh, increasing the barriers, increasing the uh, waterfall, but it's not really a critical factor for my current. So that is why I'm emphasizing that uh, energy band diagrams already giving us a lot of insight uh, before looking at the IV curves, which we will examine in a bit. Those are the current and the voltage curves. So now, uh, look at, let's look at the carrier concentration. We will go to the other side. See, 
I mean, we're trying to get these poor electrons on this side, okay? And uh, we're trying to deplete them all and trying to, under the influence of the electric field, uh, we're trying to uh, drive them in the opposite direction. Okay, and that's really not, uh, that doesn't matter a lot, like based on the, uh, the voltage, okay? All right, so now we are ready to look into the next thing, the IV characteristics. That's the last thing we, uh, maybe, maybe we can look at one more thing. Let me see, excess carrier, optical generator, no. This doesn't have the uh, the charge distribution. Yeah. So let's look at the IV characteristic right now. And this is what we end up with. So this is the zero point, okay? So all this part here is what we call the reverse bias, where we, we would increase the waterfall height, but it doesn't depend on how much the water height is. It depends on the population of the electron. So that is kind of almost independent of the applied voltage. So this is voltage axis that you're applying. This is the current that you're extracting. In a way, you can think of it like the electrons that are uh, uh, going around the whole system and creating the, uh, or completing the whole current. So we have the, uh, the battery here and we will have a, a current that's flowing in uh, based on the, of course, the battery polarization, it will depend the uh, position, but uh, this has to do with the electrons that are uh, continuously going in both directions, okay? So as for the positive uh, bias, on the other hand, like I said, there's a, gonna be an exponential increase because we're decreasing that barrier and the electrons will have a better likelihood. So after a while, it will be really very much easier for the electrons. So uh, that's the threshold voltage for the diode. And uh, if you uh, want to integrate a diode into your system, for example, that's what I was doing uh, when I was an undergraduate too. I was uh, putting these diodes into my elect electric system, electronic design. And when I go to purchase a diode from the manufacturer, uh, I was just looking for at that point, like the threshold voltage, what is gonna be the, the point where they will start conducting. So that was the critical, the most critical thing for me when I was looking from a system perspective. So this is more or less that voltage that when it will start to conduct, okay? All good, so this is the basic diode. I hope I was able to reinforce you the, uh, the diode basis, basics. Now we will continue with the, uh, the solar cell. So going back to the first simulation option, and then we will say, again, the parameter list. And in this case, we will select the uh, silicon, uh, crystalline silicon solar cell now in light, okay? You're all with me? Okay. Now, we will really make use of this third layer and I'll explain that, but if, if we look at the parameters here for layers, we see that the layer thickness is 0 0.3 micrometers. It's almost the same, I mean, not almost, it's identical, the same diode that we just looked into, okay? And the other one is the P-type, the large P-type, that's also the same. And now we have a, another uh, layer at the bottom. So if we were to draw it, we would have three layers. We would have a thin layer here, another layer here. So this would be my same, the N plus region, the P region. Now the third layer is also P type. It's 0 0.8 micrometers thick. So it's uh, intermediate. It's not as thin as the N plus, not as thick as this, of course, the P. P is the dominant. And it's uh, also very heavily doped. So two times 10 to the 18. Okay, now let's run this uh, simulation just as it is, okay? And then uh, now this absorption file will be used because this time it's gonna be, the light will be absorbed. 
we're not going to touch that part. Okay. So when we come to here, this portion is here to actually give you a standard for the incoming light source. So this will make sure that everyone doing simulation or everyone doing experiments all around the world will use the same input power from the calibrated source, the light power. And we will not really touch anything. We will later on change a couple of things here, but we will uh, just hit the simulate button. And as it's doing that, let me share my other screen again. Because let's remember what the, how the solar cells work from yesterday. Yeah. So in this case, the idea was we would create these charged particles. So like we would uh, create the electron and hole pairs with the, thanks to the light. Oops. For some reason I lost the... <sighs> Yeah, when the light's energy is enough, higher than the band gap energy of the semiconductor. Created charged particles. In this case, this would be again the P-type portion and we would have the N-type, of course. The created electron now as the minority carrier on this side, we would try to drive it thanks to this, uh, again, the drift influence of the PN junction. That's why we're using the solar cell. We're kind of trying to understand, uh, like trying to um, isolate these two into their own region. So we will say, okay, I have an electron here. The electrons need to go to this side, okay? So that's going to be the new idea. Instead of trying to send the electrons from this side to the other side over the barrier, that's what we just did for the simple diode, we will now force the electrons to go to the, their own side, the end side. Okay. So that's exactly why the uh, illumination current will flow in the reverse direction than the normal PN junction diodes because we are forcing the electrons to the other side. This will make sure that we will have a nice uh, uh, hole and uh, uh, electron uh, nicely separated from each other. Okay. After I hit the simulation thing, it has a tendency to kick me out. But yes, now we have uh, solved it. And uh, it's going to show us this as the simulation number two. So if you use the scroll bar, it's going to show the one that we previously uh, worked on. That is the simple PN junction diode. If we come here, this is the solar cell right now under illumination. Okay. Everything is the same. We just edit this layer. So if you zoom into this part, you will notice that I have now this additional P plus layer, like we said right? And the acceptor concentration would be higher. What will the, be the implication of this? There will be a band bending. So if we select now in this new simulation, energy band diagrams, let's select energy band diagrams. And once we do this, we will realize that there is going to be another band bending here because here the okay it says quasi but the let's make it simpler the uh, the whole uh, the fermi level here will be closer to the balance band because this side is heavierly uh, doped than the other side the previous p side okay so this is my p plus side uh, 
my eye pen is creating problems here. This is the P side. So to equilibrate again the Fermi level between the two, I would have to again have to uh, uh, bend these uh, energy bands. So we'll come to the importance of this in a bit. Now I'm zooming out. Let's look at the this time. The IV characteristics. Again, you gave me the same thing. So I am hoping it gave you the right result. Let me just terminate this one and I will, because it doesn't conveniently show me the whole thing. So I'm just going to open it again. For some reason, sometimes it's not showing the whole picture. So I'm just going to the same example, not changing anything, just hitting simulate. And then looking at the IV. Yes, this is what I was actually looking for, finally. So we read an IV current. This is uh, just a flipped version. So what did we say about the diode current? current? So this is my I, the current. This is my voltage. As I'm increasing the, so this is the reverse part, it doesn't really conduct that much. And as soon as it goes to the positive side, it starts conducting. For the illuminated diode, okay, in this case, this is just the mirror symmetry. What I mean is, it's actually gonna, so once I send the light, okay, it's going to start conducting in the opposite way. So it will have an illumination current that's being conducted in the opposite way. So you can think of it simply as a superposition. So we will decrease this overall graph. It's a simple mathematical problem. Just uh, uh, lower it down by an amount of IL. Okay, it's not as simple as that, of course, but we're just bear with me. We're trying to... Uh, do that. So I tried to draw it, but I hope I was successful. So this part actually now has been just flipped to this part. So that's why it's showing us like that. You, you may ask, why is it doing it? Just for convenience, actually, because people don't like to work in this uh, negative quadrant. Okay. They just flip it to the other side, but actually this is what we're observing. Now, uh, I told you a couple of things that there would be an important definition, the efficiency of the solar cell, which would be the given as the, okay, I'm trying to draw the best uh, rectangle I could get. That would involve the two areas, that area and like roughly like maybe a little less, but this area. So the efficiency, would be correlated to the filling factor, okay, which would come from the um, the division of these two areas, okay. So the uh, the big uh, red area and the smaller blue area. Okay. And I would like to remind you that the efficiencies of the solar cells, uh, simple solar cells, are like in the range of 20, uh, 20 something percent. All right, now. We will do the following. To understand the importance of that, uh, the third layer, we will go back to our parameter list. And this time, if you come to the third layer, let's try to kill that by saying, I will have only two layers. Let's, let, let's try if it will work this way, fine. Okay, so I killed the third layer by just saying I have only two layers. Number of layers is two. And let's hit the simulate button one more time. Okay.
All right, now let's look at the uh, energy band diagrams. Well, now in this case, I would not see that bending here. So see, I don't have that additional layer. So the uh, energy band diagrams are flat because I don't have that layer anymore here, simply. So now if I go to the IV characteristics, it's gonna give me this. So this is the new IV plot, and let's try to compare this plot with the previous plot that we had. Okay, I hope you can see the difference. So this is the new plot we just created without the third layer. This is the plot we gained with the third layer. This is the previous simulation we just did. So of course, this second one, as you can see, will outweigh the performance of the uh, the new one. So that's why actually we are putting the, the third layer because we'd like to increase the efficiency and I am increasing the efficiency. Just let's look at the current that we can flow to the through the uh, solar cell. The solar cell is right now running 39.4 milliamps. So 39.4 milliamps per centimeter square. This is with that third layer. Without the third layer, I am running 38. So you can see we have elevated the short circuit current. And we also increased the open uh, circuit voltage too. So these are the open circuit and the short circuit currents. So these are the crossing points of the X and Y axis, basically. These are the two important parameters because my uh, solar cell efficiency is all related to the multiplication of these two. So it's 0 0.6 here. The higher, the better. So when I put the, the barrier, the, the new layer, it's gonna jump up to 0 0.62. And the current also jumps up too, see? So uh, this is immediately showing us how we can um, increase the uh, performance of the solar cell, but we can also compare it by looking into one more thing. So let's try to do the following, go to the parameter list. And this time we will say in the simulations, let's activate the quantum efficiency. This is gonna show us how well the solar cell will absorb the light, okay, in a way. So just turn this on and simulate. In the meantime, let me show you what's going on. What's the difference between these two simulations? Okay. So we're here and like I told you, this is what's happening. So this is just a simple diode. Okay, I'm not sharing the right screen. Let me share the right screen. Yeah, so this is the simple diode that I have. What I'm doing is I am illuminating with the light and it just lowers down the, the whole graph because now we're creating the charge carriers, meaning that we have a, a, a current that we are creating too. And as I'm illuminating with more light, it goes down even more. That's the idea. And then we just flip it up. That's exactly what we have seen here. Okay. So how about that? Uh, third layer. What's the importance of the third layer? Okay. Here's the importance. We have to remember the the recombination. Okay. We're creating these uh, electron hole pairs. Let's see. I showed you this earlier yesterday too. So the light comes in. Let's see one more. Light comes in and it creates an electron hole pair. So that's good. And this electron now can make to the end side. So we created another electron hole pair, but see what happened? 
this guy caught up with the hole, so they recombine. We, re we created another electron hole pair, but they recombine again. So especially they like to recombine at the end here. So that is why we try to avoid that scenario. So this is what we're doing actually. We have these electrons in the P side. So whenever we have electrons in the P side, we would like to make sure that they don't reach the bottom layer here, which is the metal solar cell junction, the, uh, the place where they meet, okay? There are too many defect sites here, lots of defects like we covered earlier. So that creates the opportunity for the electrons to be lost. See, they are disappearing. They are, once they're created, they have to go to the other side, the end side. They should not come down here. To make sure that that is happening, we are basically adding that additional layer. And uh, we are saying to the electrons, okay, let's add that layer. We're saying that, okay, we just dope this site. We added an additional barrier there. So it's no longer like this. And it doesn't just meet with the your electrode here, the metal. But in terms of the energy band diagrams, we have a little bit of another barrier that is waiting right now for the electrons, okay? So if they happen to somehow go in the reverse direction, get lost, they will be, uh, uh, they will see this barrier and they will not be able to uh, recombine and get lost completely being un annihilated here. So I can make use of these electrons if I can recapture them too. And that's what we just uh, have seen here. So let's go back to the simulation one more time. Okay. Now this time we will look at the, what we call the uh, quantum efficiency. Okay. So if we zoom into this part, this is actually showing us how well the solar cell is absorbing, is uh, making use of the incoming light and transforming it in, with respect to the wavelength of the incoming light. So this is the wavelength, okay? And this is the efficiency, as you can see. So efficiency with respect to wavelength, all that light comes in, and this is the point around here. This is the point where the, the band gap of the silicon, our solar cell ends, okay? Uh, beyond this wavelength, so this is what's happening. I have the band gap, right? And I have the incoming light. If the light's energy is higher or equal, Then the band gap, I will be able to excite the electron and get the conduction. The solar cell will be facilitated. But here, the wavelength is increasing. That means that my electron energy is decreasing because I would like to remind you, the energy of the photon is related with its the Planck constant times nu, the frequency. Frequency is shown to be divided by C, the speed of light, divided by wavelength. So, if the wavelength of light is higher, its energy is lower. They're inverse to proportional. So, what will happen is my light source will not have enough energy to actually excite these electrons up to the uh, higher energy level. Okay? Its energy will not be sufficient enough. So that's why I'm not able to excite anything here. I'm not able to convert anything into electrical energy because of the wavelengths here. So this is the situation with the two layer case. Now going back, we will do the same, but for the added layer, we will increase this to three and the third layer will hopefully pop up with the same information. And now we will simulate that again one more time. 
we'll try to compare and contrast the uh, quantum efficiencies, how well the light is being absorbed. So what I'm trying to see is, if I change the new share, okay. Okay, so this is our case, exactly like our case. So we have the N plus side and we have the P side. The light is coming in and it's exciting these charge carriers, as you can see here. We will try to make use of this wavelength of light but this wavelength of light while it's getting in from the sun the longer wavelengths will be able to penetrate to the deeper parts of the solar cell so they will go into the deeper parts that's a problem as you can see why because if the electron hole pair is created here their electron is very close to the metal side again right so i would like to prohibit that meeting center for the electrons and i would like to encourage them to go to the other side this is only true for the longer wavelength electrons the shorter wavelength electro uh, shorter wavelength uh, uh, lights i should say not electrons will be created here so depending on the the wavelength of the light that is coming in their creation centers will be different. So the short wavelengths will be generally creating the uh, whole pairs like in here. The longer wavelengths will create them here. So let's see what we're making use of the, if how well we're making use of those longer wavelengths. Okay, so what do I observe between the two simulations? So when I have two layers, so these are the longer wavelengths. Let's zoom into the graph completely. Okay, so these are the longer wavelengths. The tail here is showing us the longer wavelength portion. This is the case for two layers, and this is the case for three layers. The three layer case is, of course, enabling us to convert the electricity much more efficiently. Uh, we are able to capture the longer uh, wavelength electrons as well. Whereas for the two layers, I can't guide them well, they recombine. All right. So, that concludes our solar cell discussion. And uh, let's continue with the thermal oxidation. If you like, we can give a, a 10 minute break in between so we can continue right after. Does that sound good? Okay. All right. Let's give a 10 minute break and uh, let's meet around 1025.